Martin. Thanks. Kia ora, Ben. <laughs> Kia ora, Katoa. Who here uh, has heard of Gopher? And who likes Gopher? Wow, that's not a whole lot. I really did like Gopher a whole lot because, you know, it was a protocol that allowed me to extract information. And while the usability wasn't really that great, um, I wasn't distracted by a lot of the bling that we see nowadays on the web. And probably as many of you, thank you very much for showing up, probably like many of you, I'm sort of at war with what the web has become. Because when I go out there and I want to surf, I want the information, I, I know what I want to get, and I don't want anything other shoved into my face. But unfortunately, today's experience of the web is quite a different one. Let me just, for the sake of demonstration, so this, is, this talk is going to be a live demo. I have sacrificed a goat this morning, so it should work out. <laughs> unfortunately, I'm a little bit unused to the uh, UI here, the, uh, the, um, um, the resolution, so you might have to bear with me a little bit. Um, let's load a website, stuff.co.nz, which is sort of the uh, slash dot of New Zealand. Don't quote me on that. And here you go, stuff is loading. What you can see down here in the network console are HTTP requests that are being sent out from my browser to various parts of the uh, internet as part of the website loading up here. And, and here is a wonderful extension called Firefox Lightbeam that attempts to visualize what's going on. So it went really fast. The network here is blazingly fast. Um, but you can see that every single one of these triangles that have gathered around the circle in the middle, which is my website, are actually third parties that my browser has reached out to in order to obtain resources or maybe to let that party know what I'm doing. In total, it's 23 third party sites. And I'm a little bit confused right now because when I did this yesterday, it showed 73. And so I'm thinking that I may have left some of the settings that I'm about to talk to you about on, and so we're being protected from trackers. Oh yeah, here it is, tracking protection. So Firefox actually has tracking protection built in in recent versions. Let me turn that off and reload the page, because I want this to be a little bit bigger. There you go, we're at 26 already, it's still loading, it's still loading. You can see all the requests down here. We're still loading. There's a whole bunch about to come in, there you go, 27, 29. 32, 34, 35, and so on and so forth. Look at what's happening down here. I'm just loading a website. Yeah, I'm just loading a website. Um, OK, let's be fair for a second. Let me take stuff.co.nz out of this. Right? So this is now only the requests that are not going to anywhere within the stuff.co.nz domain. We're at 68 third-party sites, 69 third-party, 70, 71, 72, and 73. Oh, yes, something changed. 75. <laughs> this is amazing. 76, 77. The world is finding out about me visiting this website, and I haven't even started scrolling yet. Yeah? I mean, <laughs> let's scroll, OK? Are you ready for this? Let's scroll. OK, nothing's happening. This is a bit of a anticlimactic situation here. I'm not prepared for this. Theoretically, there's more stuff going on. That's right. Theoretically, technology has it such that trackers, what we're visiting here, uh, witnessing here, trackers actually have the ability to analyze how much time I'm spending on a given section of a website, so as to and that is the entire problem that I'm talking to you about today, maximize ad revenue. Because at some point in time, somebody came up with the idea that to finance the free internet, we serve ads. And then obviously someone thought better of it and said, no, that's wrong expression in English. Somebody improved upon that idea and started to serve ads that you wanted to see. And that was basically the birth of the ad uh, industry as we know it nowadays. Now, I don't want to risk doing too much of an HTTP 101 course here, but do let me quickly look at what one of these requests is so that we know what we're talking about. Um, at other conferences, there's this thing called clicking. You know, people start clicking when they really like something. 
I'm going to propose that you start clicking when you really don't like what I'm doing so that I get an idea about when, when I'm boring you so I can move on, yeah? So let's look at one of these requests here. Let's go to pubmatic.com, for instance. And let's look at specifically the request that I'm sending out. So you can see a couple of fields in here. There, I'm, send, I'm telling this pubmatic.com website, I have no idea what they do, but stuff supposedly does, that I'm surfing the web with my Mozilla 5.0. It's actually running on a PowerPC Mac. It's not the case, but we're faking a user agent here a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I was supposed to have turned that off, but apparently I didn't. I'm sorry about that. Um, we're also telling it the refer, where I'm coming from. Again, this is uh, actually not supposed to be that website already. Let me just have a look what I'm doing wrong here. There's something not set correctly. Oh, this is... Okay, well, for, the, for all intents and purposes, the theory goes that um, my browser is telling this uh, website on the request that is being made that I'm coming from a different website so that actually the websites out there can plot where I'm coming from and where I'm going to. Are you okay, Adam? Sorry. Um, and then finally, there's another field in here called cookie. Um, and basically, I'm not going to tell you much about cookies, but basically last time I went to that site, the web server instructed my browser to please, when it comes back to that web server, send that information, presumably so they can present a customized version, but also um, so they can track me. So I don't particularly like that. Pretty sure that nobody out there would particularly like that if they knew what was going on, but as we heard from Serena earlier, um, nobody really knows or cares or has the possibility to really do something about that. So what I want to show you today is a selection of Firefox add-ons. Most of those work with Chromium as well, by the way, um, that I use in order to minimize the footprint that I leave when I surf the web. And first and foremost of those, my absolute favorite, is called U-Matrix. Now, U-Matrix is not about the matrix. U-Matrix is about a table with rows and columns, and I'm going to try to figure out how to use the uh, very limited screen estate that I have available to show you what I mean. There you go. This is U-Matrix UI. It is currently disabled, but I'm trying to show you what it can do, because when you scroll down on the UI of U-Matrix, you can see in the rows every single server that my browser has reached out to, and in the columns, the type of resource that is being requested. So I'm about halfway down the, the line now. Yeah? There's a lot going on. Clearly, everything of, all of that is necessary for me to just read the news. So this, this may or may not be a better way to illustrate what's going on. I mean, Lightbeam is very visual. This is a little bit more structured versus the network console that I showed um, with a lot of data that are basically swamping, going to swamp anyone looking at it. Um, but the great thing about U-Matrix is that I can actually now start interacting and, con and configuring my browser and telling my browser specifically what I want it to do and what I don't want it to do. Right now, the whole thing is disabled. So I'm going to turn this on, and the visuals have changed to the point where yellow now indicates I want resources to be loaded from this site, and blue means I do not want this site, this server, to be contacted. You'll also notice that up here in the uh, column headers, CSS and image is selected by default because clearly we need style sheets and we also need images always on from everywhere. And because images and CSS files are not Google Analytics, nobody's going to track us, right? Well, I'm pretty sure you all have heard of the one-by-one one pixel images that are being loaded. There are quite a couple of stu on stuff.co.nz, which I'm not going to bother identifying in the network stream right now. So let's get rid of images and load them only when I need them. 
not by default anyway. And this is a choice that I can make using this user interface. And also CSS files. I mean, it's great that I can, you know, have bold and larger fonts and even web fonts, yeah? But then again, fonts.googleapis.com, I'm not saying that that is a tracking resource. But if I were running a company that, whose business model was based on data, I might might use those access logs. So I'm turning it off. I'm turning the default off, turning the default off on images off. That's actually now for stuff.co.nz. Um, let me explain one other part of this UI, which is the very top left corner. You can see that I can actually apply different rules to different subparts of the domain. So I can actually make rules apply to www or just to stuff.co.nz or just to code.nz, which is highly useful, or to everything. And as a matter of fact, I kind of, I personally make the choice that by default for everything out there, I do not want CSS and images to be loaded from any resource out there, except for the first party, because that's kind of the point of the web. I mean, you know, if you're, yeah, you get it. So I'm going to keep that on. I'm also going to allow frames from the first party. Frames are otherwise considered evil sometimes, um, that's, which is why they're blue up here, but I'm going to allow that for the first party. So if I go back and change the uh, view to stuff.co.nz, the default of CSS and images has now changed. None of these images and CSS further down here are being loaded by default, except for the first party because I'm actually prepared to give my data to stuff, otherwise I shouldn't be browsing their website in the first place. So with that in place, let's reload. Down here we have the network console. I'm going to leave the filter of showing nothing that actually goes to stuff itself in place. And I've reset over here the light beam data. I'm going to do a control shift R and reload the stuff website. Note how the network console stays empty. This means that there are currently no requests being sent to any other website out there except for stuff itself. Look at Lightbeam. Two third-party sites being contacted. What are those? Oh, my.stuff.co.nz and resources.stuff.co.nz. I consider that okay in the context of this exercise. And what about the website? Hey, look, it's got a headline, there's text, it's even got images. It's almost like I can read the news. <laughs> but there are no advertisements. There are no trackers. Nobody else but stuff and myself find out right now what I'm doing. Now, at this point in time, I'd like to say that stuff and various other journalistic agencies out there they do their stuff, pun on words there, they do their work for free on the web, kinda, right? Ads are used to pay salaries. And I'm in no position here, and I certainly do not want to advertise for, there's another pun on words there, gosh, I'm so terrible, advertise for blocking ads. Um, but it's sort of what the game has become. Ads are a symptom, or maybe the cause, they're definitely right in the middle of this tracking business. And if I value my privacy, and ads are what, what uh, go against my privacy choices, then I'm sorry, but I won't load them. I'm sorry, stuff.co.nz, I'll load your website, I'll happily consume your news, and hey, if you allowed me to, for instance, have a very simple micropayments process by which I could give you a dollar every single time I liked something, I might actually do that, but I'm certainly not going to pay with my data, with my usage patterns that you feed on to, how many were there, 78, 79 third-party sites, who will do with those data, I don't know what. Now I've actually um, said nobody but myself and stuff find out about this, and this is because another extension that I've used here is uh, HTTPS Everywhere. We've kind of gotten to the point now where almost everything is HTTPS anyway, but please do have that extension 
enabled in your browsers anyway, because it ensures that even though there are legacy uh, possibilities of contacting web servers on port 80, this extension will make sure that that only happens once, the first time, and from then on, you'll be on a secure connection, uh, whatever secure means in that context. So I'm going to enable that. It's going to reload the website, but nothing is actually going to change over here. Um, just to complement, Matrix gives me a couple of other tools that I, oh, wrong extension. Um, a couple of other tools that I can use to further um, limit my footprint. And those are forbidding mixed content. That's, I believe, um, non-SSL content in SSL websites. Um, forbidding web workers. If any of you have been to KiwiCon, there was a fantastic talk about service workers and web workers. Those kind of processes in your browser that can stick around for hours after you stop visiting a website and actually act in your behalf within your environment and keep sending data back and forth. So you may not want that. You can turn these off globally. You can turn them on for individual websites. Very helpful. Spoof the referrer header. Somehow I already did that. Um, which basically just means I'm not going to tell any site where I'm coming from, but I'm just going to pretend that I'm coming from their site. So you saw that earlier when we went to that advertising page. It pretended to come from the advertising page to the advertising page. And then also no script tags, I can spoof those, um, furthermore reducing my, my um, footprint. Now, sometimes you need special functionality. For instance, of course, Google's um, um, cognitive capitalism recapture. Um, and YouTube and Twitter and so on. Um, recent versions of Umatrix have allowed you to make it very easy to just download this recipe that will then enable uh, a recapture for this very web session that you're in. Because unless you choose to actually persist the changes by clicking on this lock button, which I've just done without touching a mouse button, that's kind of weird, um, they will not stay around. Until, uh, when you open the browser the next time, you'll start again with a clean slate. Now, at this point, let me quickly open up the preferences of the browser. This is Firefox. Chromium or Chrome has, has very similar uh, preferences for privacy and security. And, uh, you know, it, it gives you the possibility now to, to block trackers. Firefox Lightbeam is actually controlling this, and I had it turned. Um, off, or now have it turned off. Also, third-party cookies and cookies in general. Um, interestingly, you'll note that I choose not to block third-party cookies in the browser preferences, because it is a bit of a one and zero decision that I'm making here. Resources.stuff.co.nz was considered a third party. I don't really want to be blocking the cookies. I wanted much more fine-grained uh, control over the um, tracking behavior that my browser is exposing. And Umatrix actually gives that to me. The first column here um, in that matrix is about cookies. And I'd much more prefer, rather than saying no third party cookies whatsoever, I'd rather be able to say, look, I want cookies from stuff. I actually want cookies from Akamai, and then I can enable them here. Or I can um, say that Adam, Asia, I actually want to use all of them. Um, you'll see that the frame block will override this, and so on. Play around with the UI a little bit. It's a fantastic resource uh, to use. It gives you a lot of control, and I think it's very intuitive, at least to mathematically thinking minds, which is unfortunately not the vast majority of the, uh, of the web users out there. But that's another story. Um, also, sometimes, similar to reCAPTCHA, sometimes you need to use resources that are being made available um, on third-party websites. Let's have a look at Stack Overflow. When I load Stack Overflow, then it doesn't really work, right? I mean, that's, that, okay, that's, that's a gopher experience for you right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm gonna have a quick look, yeah? I mean, okay, that needs to be loaded, Stack Overflow static, okay, so on and so forth. I can reload the website right there. Note how the UI stays in place. Actually, even forms that you filled in will stay filled in if you reload. It's really nice. I love it. Um, but one thing you'll note is that, okay, I'm not going, going, going to demo this right now, but one thing about the website may not work, and that's because Stack Overflow loads Ajax libraries from googleapis.com. 
And you know, even though that's not googleanalytics.com, maybe it's still being used for tracking. So, but I, I kind of need to enable it now because otherwise I can't use the website. I'm a little bit in a ditch at this point in time. Now, wouldn't it be fantastic if I could just download the Ajax libraries? I mean, it's all open source. All of these companies are built on open source anyway. Um, it's all open source. If I could just download that and serve it locally, yeah? Squid transparent proxy on my laptop. Okay, let's not go there. Um, let's use another extension that allows me to check this box here and say, I actually would like to allow, something is really wrong with my mouse button. I would really like to allow script loading from ajax.google.apis.com, but actually not contact googleapis.com. That extension is called decentralize with I's at the end rather than I-S-E or I-Z-E. And the idea of decentralize is that it includes a couple of standard resources that can be served locally and are we be, which are being updated by this add-on. So I had it previously disabled here, nothing ever happened, but if I know now reload Stack Overflow, you can see that Decentralize actually intercepted a Google-hosted library jQuery and surfed it from a local resource. So now Stack Overflow works because I can run Ajax, but Google did not find out about it. By the way, if I'm going to be releasing maybe to the conference uh, mailing list, list of these add-ons that I'm talking to you about so that you can uh, look at them one by one after the talk. You don't have to uh, take notes or, or scramble to take them down. So that's great. Um, at this point in time, let me introduce another. Why did I have this in here? There was a very good reason why I wanted you to look at Board Panda, and I can't remember now. So let me just skip over that and instead talk to you about cookies. Because cookies are actually also useful. They're not just used for tracking. They're also used to store your uh, customizations of a site and maybe also your uh, uh, login cookies, uh, your tokens that, um, for, for OAuth or what have you. Um, this extension, which is called Cookie Auto Delete, gives you, again, fine-grained control over the way that your browser deals with cookies. Generally, in the preferences of the browser, you can choose to delete the cookies after the browser session or honor the lifetime of the cookie, but that is a global setting. What Cookie Auto Delete allows you to do is to, first of all, control this on a per-site basis, actually on a per-cookie basis by now. That's the latest version that introduced this. And then furthermore, it can enable cookies, but get rid of them right after you stopped visiting a website. So if you look at the settings, then it has this thing called automatic cleaning, and I can set it to 120 seconds or 86,400 or whatever your preference is. Again, this is about giving you the power to make your own choices. And then when I stopped visiting stuff.co.nz 120 seconds later, this extension will go through your browser local storage and delete all the cookies and all the local storage, except for the ones that you whitelisted. And this is actually what the UI that I just showed is all about. I could whitelist boardpanda.com, and that would mean that when I restart my browser, the cookies that boardpanda set would be available again. If I only graylisted boardpanda.com, then they would simply stay around until the end of the browser session. So at this point in time, um, I'm ready to take some questions, but I would like, uh, let, me, let me do one more, one more of these uh, add-ons, which is called multi-account containers. That's actually not really an add-on, it's actually a feature that is being built into Firefox and has been there for a lot of years. Who's used multi-account containers? That is the vast minority. Okay, multi-account containers are basically containers four tabs, or domains, tabs actually, I think. And the idea is that you'll have a different set of cookies and local storage and browsing history and so on and so forth for individual sites. You can load 
Facebook in one container and Twitter in another container and the browser, they would actually never be able to find out about each other's sessions because they have completely separate namespaces. You can, uh, you can edit these containers and there's actually an integration with the um, cookie auto-delete UI and you can choose to keep certain cookies for certain containers and furthermore compartmentalize the way that you interact with the web. So I think that now that I've shown you the, most, the four most important of these add-ons, and I have a couple of more to go um, that are about minor or less, less obvious ways in which you're being tracked, um, at this point in time, are there any questions? Is there anything I can, I can answer? Yes. How do you go with um, these extensions becoming stale? One of the big problems with the Mozilla ecosystem in the browser is that you end up with extensions, firstly, that just don't get maintained. Yeah. And, and when they have a big changeover, like they did recently, a lot of extensions just stopped working. Right. And secondly, uh, the, the whole issue of people... Um, selling their extension to a third party and ending up with malware in the extension? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Um, all the extensions I've shown so far are live projects uh, that are completely free and open source. Um, there are some that, like, um, what was the one called? Ghostry, right? Ghostry is one that, uh, that used to do a lot of this work and also request policy, which have been sold, and nobody really knows what happens now anymore with them. Um, so it's part of your due diligence, really, um, to look at this sort of aspect. But that's the same due diligence you would do with any tool that you invest some time with and choose to actually incorporate into your workflow. And I'm part of your due diligence here because I'm telling you these are great. And uh, the more of you who jump on board, the greater they will be because they will all actually have uh, repos on GitHub. So it's, and they are very, how should I say, they are meeting a big demand at the moment so that the um, activity in these repos is actually very high. So I'm confident that they're good. But in 10 years, we'll have other ones, better ones. AI. Thank you, Martin. Uh, one of the things I'm seeing is people have these API keys, and it goes part of the get, and any of these browsers with their extensions track them, that's also a security hole. Somebody can start selling these API keys when they log to their site and things like that. Have you thought of that? Yeah, those API keys, I referred to them earlier as authentication tokens. Uh, I mean, it's part of the authentication um, um, ecosystem there. Uh, they are stored in local storage in your browser. And so a, um, this, the uh, cookie auto-delete extension, for instance, can take care of local storage for you as well. So you can have those API keys deleted 120 seconds after you leave a tab. Um, I don't know how they fit into the matrix UI. Maybe other? <laughs> it's possible, but that's definitely something to look at. Um, API keys are only, I mean, you're, you're touching on an important subject here. I've shown you the sort of like low-hanging fruits of um, the footprint that you're leaving on the web. There are a lot more. There's this f wonderful website called Browser Leaks. And basically, Browser Leaks uh, gives a lot of tools that you can run to test how much information, trackable information, your browser is leaking during the, the session. And uh, it goes as far as you know, exploiting bugs in JavaScript implementations of particular browsers that then allow pretty accurate um, identification of a person that has previously been to the site, so tracking you. Um, but I won't go into every single one of these now. Let's take one more and then uh, let me do some more extensions and do more questions at the end. Yeah, I, um, I maintain usually a, a slash Etsy slash hosts file to block all the sort of the common offenders. Do you do that? And if so, what's been your experience uh, blocking things that way? Um, ETC hosts is a DNS type like precursor. I mean, uh, basically what you can express there um, can only happen on the level of looking up domain names and resolving them into IP addresses. 
uh, I wouldn't know, for instance, how many domains Google owns. So I don't know what to put in there. I mean, obviously, it is a good uh, resource, and especially with, uh, what is it called, Adaway or something on Android. I mean, that's one of the only resources that you have to actually block uh, tracking across all of the apps. Um, but I think it's, it's actually at, a, at the wrong level. So if you wanted to um, prevent tracking at the HTTP level, you've got to be speaking HTTP and not DNS. That said, um, Umatrix does have um, a way to auto-update assets. So a couple of people ha will publish hosts files and so on, and then um, Umatrix puts those into the, um, into the UI, because I didn't go through and, and make every single one of these rows that um, have tracking uh, capabilities blue, that was actually provided by some of these third-party assets. Okay. Now, let, let me uh, continue and give you a couple of more add-ons. Um, I think the reason why I loaded Board Panda was because of the service workers, and because I turned off service workers earlier on Umatrix, you didn't actually get to see this extension here, except you did, <laughs> in action. Um, so block service workers is really easy. It just blocks service workers. It actually doesn't provide a way to whitelist them at the moment, which is kind of naff, because sometimes you really need them. At the moment, my Twitter experience basically um, means that nothing can get pushed to me. All I, I have to reload to see if somebody has mentioned me, which actually isn't so bad. Think about it. Um, it's worse with GitHub, for instance. I mean, GitHub is lovely in the sense that I can write a comment on a patch and then when the author writes back 30 seconds later, I will, actually, I will actually be able to have a discussion right there in almost real time. That, of course, is run by a service worker, and by blocking service workers altogether, I'm disabling that. But then again, you know, the thought of this convenience versus the idea that a thread keeps running for hours after I close the tab and still operates within the context of my interaction with that website, is kind of scary. And so I choose that, which I consider a more safer approach. There's also this thing called uh, um, tracking in the query strings, right? You've all see the, seen the UTM source and UTM whatever it is, um, ways by which um, the companies are trying to figure out which channel brought you to their website. Um, you can. You can leave that on, of course, because after all, it is very helpful also to uh, companies to find out what sort of outreach, what sort of marketing actually is effective. But if you really care more about your privacy, you can turn them off. You can, um, using this extension here, which is uh, called request control rules, you can disable, for instance, Google link tracking by simply ticking this box and block beacon requests, beacons being little messages that are being sent out regularly to tracking sites to make sure that they will find out continuously what you are up to on the web. Now, um, there, there's actually, it's very much, oh shoot, I can't find this now. That's the thing with live demos. You're like in a state of adrenaline, and then you're like, oh, this was so easy. I do it all the time, and now I just can't figure out how to do it. So excuse me. Um, have a look at the extension yourself. And uh, there's a manual. Ta-da. Uh, it allows you to customize all of this, um, basically, to your liking. But I already find the UI to be very intuitive, and it'll take you a long way towards protecting your privacy just to install it and it sort of has privacy and security by default. Most of these have them by default in the settings, which I think goes very much in line with what Serena has said earlier and also um, is what you should be doing. What's another extension? I have, how many minutes do I have left? 10 minutes, okay. Let me show you these two more extensions and then I think we can call it a day. Um, here, here you go, um, current active user agent, yeah? I'm using Apple WebKit, Chrome, which is, uh, and Safari, which is definitely not the case. I mean, look at this laptop. Um, 
So this is actually an extension called random UA, and I'm sort of trying to hack on it a little bit to the point where I'd like to have um, the browser send out a different user agent for every single request, just to make it extremely hard for anyone out there to correlate my behavior. And because it's not so cool if uh, at some point in time it's going to be sending out the fact that I'm using Internet Explorer 4, so, yeah, well, duck typing is not something that web developers have heard of, but uh, um, I've, I've kind of figured out that what we can do is actually pretend that we're using Internet Explorer 425, and then, you know, Chrome 7218, just keep going up, basically, because then you'll get all the cool features. Um, having a modern browser is the way to go anyway. James. Uh, the, the, the answer, I didn't understand what you were saying, but I will say yes, and let's... Virus test pattern. I know the virus test pattern. Okay, we'll chat. Yes. The question was, have you considered that by generating a unique user agent string, you're giving everyone the ability to track you even better? Yes, for that one request. That next image is going to have a completely different one. So, no. Okay, what's this one? There's a final one here. It's called Canvas Blocker. Oh, yeah, that's one of my favorites. So, um, the web has become a fantastically interactive resource, right? Um, you can do multimedia. There's actually, yesterday there was a presentation, or this morning was a presentation, another, another mini conf about real-time audio generation in your browser. Your browser is, at the same time as it is a sketching pad, it's also a mixer module, and it's a speaker, and it's a microphone, and it's got a camera and everything. All of these things can be used to identify you. As a matter of fact, this browser leaks uh, website has a module in there that can, with, I don't know, a very high level of accuracy, identify you according to the white noise that your microphone introduces into the browser stream, even though you haven't given it permission. Um, so this is another extension that I choose to enable, which basically adds some random white noise on top of that, again, making it different for every single request, and to make it harder for um, those people out there to track. Because I value my privacy, I want to value I want to use the web for the amazing resource that it is, but I'm stepping up the web against the privacy uh, violating trackers out there, and if they want to keep up tracking me and making sure that they can monetize my data, they're going to have to step up their game as well after I installed all these extensions. So that's all I have time for to show to you today. We do have time for another five minutes for questions, I believe, so let's Go for that, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, in my case, should I use the private browsing feature, or should I use your method? Uh, the, um, I think you should use my method, um, rather than the private browsing feature, because the private browsing feature is really a feature that protects you from your boss. It makes sure that your history file is not being updated, that the bookmarks are not accessible, and all these kind of things. But it is actually not, to the best of my knowledge, not something that's outward facing. So even in a private window, even though you are sort of like isolated from your work, for instance, while you go and look at cats, um, right? Um, it'll still push all of these data out there. It'll still reach out to 79 third-party sites while you're surfing that website. Oh, hi. Um, quite a number of sites say uh, we detect you using an ad blocker. You know, you can't proceed till you turn it back on. Is there an easy way around that to leave them not tracking you? Well, I, I don't want to propagate the use of ad blockers for a start. As I said earlier, I mean, we do want to make sure that the independent media industry has enough money to stay independent. Um, on the other hand, it is annoying that, yes, like the New York Times and some other websites, they have started introducing these windows that 
uh, overlay the entire site and say, basically, can you turn off your, web, your ad uh, tracker? There are some really good examples of how they are doing things right. For instance, in Germany, there is Süddeutsche Zeitung. Um, they go through lengths to explain to you who they are giving the data to. That's in part probably informed by the GDPR. And it will actually allow you to make that decision using U-Matrix for that one site to actually give permission to display ads. Then there are others that are really bad. They basically say, either do this or you can't come here. You could file GDPR uh, violation claims against them because according to the GDPR, um, you're, you must let me use your site whether I give you my data or not, and otherwise I'm going to sue you for up to 4% of your turnover. But maybe that's not the right way to go about it. Sometimes, sometimes you can go to the DOM editor and simply select that window and click delete and <laughs> read the website as it is. So that goes in line again with what Serena said, I think, about security. Um, there's easy ways around it. But uh, in general, I mean, write a message to them and say, look, I'm happy to pay for you. Can you please not monetize my data or feed my data to third parties? I think that's the best answer I have. Uh, you mentioned you weren't really a fan of DNS level tracking and tracking blocking, but what are your thoughts on using, for example, a pie hole, um, especially in the case where you don't have this kind of control, game consoles, smart TVs, smart fridges, or whatever you have, um, you, you've got obviously no option within the device itself to do any of this. So really, you're, I, I believe your only option is something like that. Do you have any sort of thoughts? Would you use something like that? Well, if it's better than nothing, then yeah, of course. Um, I, I didn't want to say that DNS blocking is bad. Anything, anything that steps up the game against these privacy abusers is good, right? I just don't. Con I, there are better tools out there, but as you as you said correctly, um, the gaming console is not going to let you install UMatrix. So put Linux on there, and then. Hi, <laughs> um, are you familiar with the uh, with projects like the Brave browser project? And yes. could you comment on what you think they're doing well or not well enough? I, I'm, I'm familiar with the existence of the Brave browser. Um, I've not actually used it to the point where I can comfortably answer that question. But uh, it's, it's great to see projects like the Brave browser out there, which are really privacy-preserving browsers. And I hope that they're going to grow this sort of fine-grained possibility, maybe even in a way that it's private and secure by default, and then they figure out really smart UI, UX approaches to tapping into your preferences, figuring out what you really are comfortable with. Because my privacy and your privacy, they aren't, our understandings are completely different, right? Thank you, Martin. Um, one question I have is, how long does it take you to sort of browse the web with all of these layers that you need to sort of manipulate to actually get to the content? Because I feel like the cognitive overload that I will have to go through just cleaning out everything is just going to be too much when I actually need to just get some work done. Yeah, um, that's a very valid question. Um, so I, I actually come from, from no script and request control. I've, a lot of people have probably used that, which were two extensions where you had to do the same thing pretty much for all of the websites. Um, and it was non-intuitive, and they had different paradigms of usage, and it was a pain. And, and, and I ended up actually not using that anymore. I ended up just saying temporarily, I'll allow everything, right? Um, so that's not the goal. Um, I find that U-Matrix is a lot more intuitive, and it does these two things at the same time. And then once you, if you're actually ready to do that, um, to, to invest some time at the very beginning, you can benefit from that for a long time. So. I, for, for my web browsing habits, most of the websites I visit are the same ones over and over again. So having installed these preferences once gets me the benefits later. But yes, in preparation of one of my other talks that I'm giving later this week where I wanted to do a lot of images and so on and so forth, yeah, I spend a lot of time um, clicking allow this temporarily just in order for me to be able to load the images. And there's actually an issue uh, request a feature request for you matrix of mine in there that basically lets me assign a key combination to do this. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> I, I have a related question. So I also have plugins that take me forever to actually end up loading a page sufficiently so I can use it. If my mom wants to install plugins to protect her browser tracking, you mentioned earlier that a lot of these you can just install, set, and forget, and they give you a good level of security. Can you comment on what non-technical people can do to protect yes, themselves? Yes, a very good question. Thank you, Ben. Um, so the EFF, even though they have uh, just re 
partnered with a questionable company out there and are getting a lot of stuff about that, um, have a website out there called Panopticlick, which is currently not loading. <laughs> the EFF also have a, um, an extension out there which is called Privacy Badger. And Privacy Badger, and there's another one that I forget the name of that is at the, at the moment at the top the, of the curated list of privacy add-ons in Firefox um, that is very similar. Uh, ba basically, take all of this away. They say, just enable it, and we'll, be, we'll then look at your browsing habits and try to figure out what, what you like and what you don't like. And I think that is a fantastic application of machine learning that's probably happening in the background. And that is what I would install for anybody who doesn't want to be dealing with matrices and, and configuration. Um, but for me personally, and probably most of you in the room, I do like to be in control of that matrix rather than have machine learning decide what I consider private and what not. Cool. All right, well, on which note, um, I'm going to have used that opportunity to ask the last question. Uh, we are going to lunch, but a big round of applause for my.